Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what robots can do and what I work on. And uh, these robots are machines that look like this, and they actually have uh, all sorts of capabilities to be autonomous. So basically, they have the ability to perceive the world, sensors. They have uh, all sorts of like uh, uh, computation, so computers, and then they move. So there is a lot of research going on in these mobile robots that are not about Baxter only doing factory type of like uh, actions, but they try to be part of our environment. So that's what I work on, and uh, they move like this at Carnegie Mellon. We have four of them moving in our buildings, uh, transporting things from place to place, uh, guiding visitors from one place to another, and they magically and beautifully stop at the right place when they are tasked to go to a particular location. So I'll just share with you uh, a little bit of the technical aspect that is behind this. So these robots to move have a map of the environment on the left, which is an estimate of their position, those orange circles. And eventually they have cameras, depth cameras, shown in the top right uh, part. And we process that enormous amount of data to detect walls, uh, planes in the image, and those are mapped into the actual uh, map, and the robot knows its location and can eventually make the right turns. So this is very crucial because the robot is processing physical information, not just digital information, and it's capable of producing tasks that are very much conceptual, go there, bring me these, do all sorts of like tasks. These robots are moving everywhere, but they have something that is uh, very uh, interesting to, um, to realize. They have a lot of limitations, and I, I foresee they will have limitations for a long time, and they have limitations, and what we came up with was this concept that the robots, while helping people, also can ask for help. So these robots know their limitations, uh, actuation limitations, cognition limitation, perception limitations. For example, these robots, as you see here, do not have any arms, so they cannot press elevator buttons. So when they are by the elevator needing to go to the ninth floor, they get to the elevator and eventually they can they can actually ask for help. So they sit by that elevator hall, and they basically say, can you please press this elevator button and hold the door so I can go in? So that particular aspect, they are not capable of doing, and they ask for help. Humans generously uh, don't have a problem in pressing elevator buttons, so they press elevator buttons, and then eventually the robot is able to enter the elevator by itself, which is uh, its autonomy, and then ask to actually press the elevator button to where it wants to go, and eventually the robot completes its, task, its tasks with the need for the help of the humans in what it's not capable to do. If humans don't help it, it sends us email. I've been waiting for someone to press the elevator button. Nobody came. Please come and help me. If someone is in front of it and they don't get out of the way, they just say, come and rescue me. So there is this concept of autonomy. You, you, this is, seems to you, uh, I mean, interesting, but the fact that we let the thing go and gets out of our sight, out of our sound, and it's completely autonomous, makes you have chills that what is it, uh, uh, is it going to do the right thing? And so we need this particular kind of help. It has moved at CMU for more than a thousand kilometers. It's actually capable to ask the web uh, when it can, when it does not know. Bring, 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 bring me a coffee to the lab. I don't know what this object place. is. I'm going to the web to find out where this object should be. And eventually the web magically tells you that it can be in an office or in a kitchen, and it asks the human, where should I go? And the human very generously again says, okay, you know what, go to the kitchen. And the robot does go to the kitchen and asks, now I'm done, I know, and is this the right thing I should do? Yes, and there goes the robot and I don't have time to show, but the important thing is that it learns from this interaction. Cobot learns about like more than 10,000 facts of interacting with people, that coffees, kitchens, and so forth. Finally, my last slide is to say that a lot of the research we do now is on having this robot reveal its state. 
So we have this transparency. So we have added lights that ter tell which way they are turning, uh, t lights that say that it's blocked. To call the attention by the elevator, there are like blinking lights. And most importantly, we are working on this problem of verbalization. Instead of data visualization, which only enables humans to visualize data, humans actually need to be able to understand what the robot does. And therefore, the robots now generate explanations about why are you late, cobot? It comes to my office like five minutes late, why? And instead of me having to go and Pythoning and going to some logs and doing a lot of coding, we can ask through language. So in summary, this is a, a beginning of understanding that in fact we are in this symbiotic relationship between humans and robots and the web and humans will need the help of the robots, the robots will need the help of humans and this is going to be a society hopefully for the benefit of all that can have this ability to interact between these machines, these AI, these robots and the humans and the web. And there are like uh, publications available at my website. Thank you. Thank you.